I think all in all, the best time to buy a house or a stock or any kind of investment really is yesterday. The next best time is today. Welcome to the On Purpose Investor Podcast with your host, Eric and Tiffany Vogel. We spent several hard years building a rental property portfolio so we could have more time with our family and live our ideal life. Finding your path can be difficult, so we're here to help guide you along the way with lessons, tips, and tricks to design and implement your dream life through real estate investing. Now sit back, turn up the volume, and get ready for this episode of the On Purpose Investor. Hey, Pathfinders, and welcome back to the On Purpose Investor. I'm your host, Eric, with my beautiful co-host, Tiffany. I feel like you forgot that you were supposed to do. Nope. Just, uh, just, I don't get any accolades today. You're just, I'm just here. No, I said beautiful. Oh, okay. That'll work for today. Oh. <laughs> you know how I really feel. Okay. Yes, of course. <laughs> well, welcome back to the On Purpose Investor podcast, where we like to talk about uh, hyper intentionality and diving into things that will help you to become a more intentional and on purpose investor, where hopefully we give you the tips and tricks and a little know-hows on how to either get started or keep moving within your investing business. And we primarily talk about real estate investing, but here and there, we are likely to talk about other things. Yeah. But today, episode 30, investing in an uncertain market. So today we're going to discuss what being in an uncertain market is like. And when I figured out what we were talking about today and I was like, hmm, what is the little funny thing I'm going to mention. And what immediately popped in my head is this little image that's circulating the internet. Uh, It had been doing it recently, but it's even more so now that, you know, we all feel like we're on the brink of something big with our market and our economy. And once this airs, we might already be in the the spiral, no matter where it is. But the image I'm referring to um, is this uh, stick figure guy. And above it, it's like millennials. So the stick figure guy represents millennials. He's got a stick and he's poking these uh, cartoon houses with the little bar graph over. Is that a bar graph? Yeah, a line graph. A little line graph above the houses and it's like going up and he's poking the houses and he's saying, come on, collapse. So it's kind of funny to me. Yeah, I think it's millennials trying to buy their first house or maybe upgrade because they're starting a family. and Or maybe they're trying to get into investing. Yeah, and they're just waiting for the market to collapse so that they can buy at a reasonable price or what they deem to be reasonable. Yeah. By and large, most millennials were, you know, 25 or under in 2008. I'm not sure how that lines up on millennials, but on the official millennials. But, you know, Tiffany and I are pretty much smacked in the middle of being a millennial. And we were graduating high school when the big, the last big housing crisis hit. So we didn't experience it as investors. We did experience it in other ways, just, you know, getting into college or, just starting our, getting our working jobs. lives, yeah. getting jobs. So we did experience that. Um, I know these days there are jobs everywhere. But back in 2008 through 2010-ish, it was hard to find a job. Oh. Um, even before then, like 2006. Yeah. I remember, I, mean, uh, I remember graduating college. I graduated in December of 2011. And I was terrified I wasn't going to be able to find a job because the economy just still hadn't recovered. Yeah. took the first job I had and it was underpaid, but... It was a good job, so can't complain too much. But well, back then, you would take pretty much anything. So it was, yeah. I I got the offer before I graduated, so and you weren't. I mean, you weren't in a position to argue salary, right? Back then, it was. Did you get your foot in the door? Yeah. I remember I applied like fifteen times to Target when I was in high school. This was like two thousand six, two thousand seven, and I had to bug them and call them and and keep asking them. You know, can I get the job? Can and you I took a, a night shift, too. And I took a night shift stocking boxes on the shelves in, in the supply in the back. And you were so. working at the vet. And I was a veterinarian technician where I would help out the vets. And you were in school. And I was in high school. So and I, I worked. And- yeah, I worked two jobs and went to high school. It was fun. I, I enjoyed staying busy. Yeah. And there were reasons why I stayed busy. Um, But that's for a whole different kind of podcast. (laughs) But I I just enjoyed staying busy and staying out of the house. Yeah, but uh, you had to fight to get that job at Target. That's right. Now you could probably go apply and get it pretty quick. Yeah. I mean, most places out there are begging for employees. Yeah. You know, they're not in a position to where they're waiting very long to fill 
yeah. slots if there are people even looking for jobs. Right. Because right. right now it's just, it's such a unique position to be in, uh, I guess, if you're out there looking for a job, because there's so many opportunities. Now, the opportunities that are out there may not be exactly what you want, but it, it is so strange to just drive through town and see all of the help wanted signs. Right. Because when we were coming up, you had to fight to get yeah. any kind of job. We didn't, didn't see that. Right. But now the the economy is shifting. Yep. We see changes happening. The Federal Reserve is increasing rates. Mm-hmm. Um, we're recording this a little bit ahead of time, just during our podcast break, trying to get ahead of things. So by the time this comes out on October 4th, I'm not sure where things will stand. We don't have a crystal ball to see, but right. things are definitely shifting. Yep. And there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. And a lot of people yeah. are saying... Oh, I'm going to wait for the market to crash before I get started. Well, you, you, I mean, there, no one has the crystal ball. No one has right. the perfect crystal ball that says the market is going to do this. But we do have friends and colleagues that went through the 08 crisis, that went through the 80s, that went through the 90s, and saw all ups and downs. And what they're all saying is this is very much like some of them, but not like any of it's them. It's a little bit yeah. like each of the crashes that yeah. have happened over the last 30, 40 years. So. And while each of them have their own speculation, it is just that. It is a speculation. Yeah. And, you know, anything could really turn the economy one way or the other. Right. No one predicted COVID happening. Right. Um, or you could, I mean, a, a crazy country could bomb another country and then boom, there is a, another war and that's going to drive the economy somewhere. Right. Or, I don't know, something natural disaster wise happens right. and crushes the economy something yeah. and just drives it in a direction right so it's just there's no crystal ball there are speculations and sometimes there are very healthy speculations that can help you to try to prepare for that outcome right but you should never dump all of your eggs in one basket of speculation you should you should feather your nest in a way to be prepared for something like that but I wouldn't put all of your birds in that yeah. or your eggs in that bird right. basket. Right. So for a new person or an, even an experienced investor looking to get more real estate assets, what do they do when they think the market's not in a good spot or it's too expensive right now? Prices were, you know, 30% cheaper last year. So I'm going to wait for prices to go down or you're just in general scared there's a collapse coming. What are they supposed to do? I mean, should they well, wait or should they jump in? Well, I mean, it, it all depends on their risk factors and their their income stream and their amount of savings. Um, if they buy a house today and it cash flows today, it cash flows positive today, then I mean, it, how much it cash flows is where it's going to tie into what is your roadmap right. and where are you headed. Right. I mean, if it cash flows $100 and that's what you're your criteria was, then that's a good deal for you. Yeah. But if you needed $500, then that's not a good deal for you. Right. Or, you know, we talked on past episodes, you know, figuring out a way to make a house cash flow, forcing right. a house to cash flow by using it in a different way other than a single family rental. Right. And maybe that is um, an avenue you want to pursue. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there, there are, I mean, the houses are 30% more on average. In our area. Right. I know some markets are 50 to 100% more. But, you know, in our area, you can cash flow on a house, especially if you set it up in a unique way. Right. You know, there's the crash pads. We live pretty close to the Atlanta airport. And so crash pads are a big thing. And right now, airlines are hurting for pilots and, and uh, flight attendants. And so there's a big hiring going on right now. And there's going to be a huge surplus of new people um, in the industry. And when they fly to different cities and they have to, they have like a one night or a two night, you know, layover. I don't know if they, what they call that for pilots, but I know, you know, for flying, we call it a layover, but where are they going to sleep? And majority of them are set up on crash pads. Uh, our neighbor is a pilot and he just messaged me yesterday. He's like, yeah, I'm in New York and I'm in a crash pad for the next day and a half. Cause that's how long his layover was. And it just rejogged my memory that we are close to a market that would support right. that. And you know, if we are getting back into the buying phase, there's no reason we can't buy a house 20 minutes north of us and set it up as a crash pad yeah. because they make similar returns as Airbnbs or as a rent by room setups. Right. So it's just another strategy to invest in an inflated market or a more expensive market and still succeed. Right. And reach your goals 
Yeah. And I think, so there's all these opportunities to increase your cash flow over a standard 12 month rental contract. Mm -hmm. But you always want to make sure that it will still cash flow with that traditional 12 month situation because you don't know if zoning is going to change or the regulations in that area or if you know that that model just doesn't work anymore like airbnbs might crash and burn another making some changes with company policy that's hurting hosts and that might not be a great long-term strategy so making sure you have a plan a b and c for that property Mm -hmm. to make sure that you don't wind up underwater on it is just, I guess, a, a safe way to approach it. Yeah, absolutely. I think all in all, the best time to buy a house or a stock or any kind of investment really is yesterday. Mm-hmm. The next best time is today. And I know we've said this on past episodes, but yes, the housing prices might decline. But if you buy on the right terms or buy at the right price, it still can be a good investment. And that... The right price, the right terms, it's all dependent on you and the strategy that works for you and your market. Yeah. But find that strategy that works. Yeah, for sure. For your Have your clear roadmap of what you want and need and then find a strategy that works for that market. You mm-hmm. might have to hustle a little bit more to find deals or get things accepted on better terms to make it cash flow because you can you can overpay for a house. But if you get good financing, it's a great deal. Yeah, I mean, if you paid 30% more for a house, but you're paying 5% less in interest, it may not sound like a lot, but that's a huge difference. Yeah, definitely. And I guess I just want to say this is not us giving advice by any means. We have no certifications. We just have a little bit of experience in this. Um, These are just our opinions. We're not forecasting anything in the market, not trying to tell you to go sell all your Airbnbs or anything like that. (laughs) Just saying this is kind of our perspective on what we see and want to pass that along to you. As a good friend of ours would say is that we are laymen. Yes. We are not professionals and we are, in fact, very stupid. Yeah. (laughs) And you should take all of this with a grain of salt. This is more just discussion points of what. Yeah. Things to get you thinking. Yeah. And, you know, there's kind of two types of deals out there. There's deals that are driven by macro trends Mm -hmm. and then deals driven by micro trends. And the macro trends are, you know, mass foreclosures or shifts in the market that cause people in mass to lose their homes. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not well studied on exactly what happened in 08, but I know that there were a lot of notes called. Yeah. Well, it's, I would say it was a lot of, short-term adjustable rate mortgages right and their payments skyrocketed Mm -hmm. kind of all at the same time and these people could no longer afford their house payment and then when they tried to sell it they were underwater because prices had tanked so much right so then it just created this big snowball in a negative way yeah that led to the housing crash so it was poorly written loans now to qualify for an adjustable rate mortgage you have to qualify for that higher interest rate, yeah. not just the payment at the lower rate. So we learned a little bit, I think, as an industry about how to better prepare for things like that. There was a lot of speculation going on, too. So I think at the end of the day, if you invest in solid fundamentals, and there are great resources out there to learn that, I highly recommend starting on Bigger Pockets. We got a lot of information there on their webinars and different books and resources on what the fundamentals are, but making sure you have properties that are solid in the fundamentals and have a, a good return and opportunity. And, and again, align with your goals. You might be in a situation where you want to invest for appreciation and you can ride that storm. You might be in a situation where you need cash flow. So knowing what you need and studying and learning and just going with the fundamentals and not the hype I think is going to be the key to success in the next couple of years. Oh, that should be quoted right there. (laughs) Follow the fundamentals, not the hype. Right. That's on the back of a shirt already. I can see it. All right. It'll be part of the swag store. Okay. With your sombrero of many hats. Oh, and the delayed gratification care bear. Yeah. We need to get on that. Yes, we do. (laughs) (laughs) So going back, the macro trends are the economy. Right. Um, So shifts that happen to your market as a whole. Mm -hmm. And there's not a national real estate market. They're all hyper local. So 
what happens in our market might be different than your market. So those macro trends are probably pretty market specific. Yeah. But then you have micro trends that are more personal. Mm -hmm. um, so we talk about the four D's, death, divorce, disaster, and debt. Yeah. So these are things that derail people's personal lives and cause a move. And there's also positive personal changes, you know, adding children. I know we've got a baby coming. If we decide for a third, I don't know that the house we're in right now is going to suit our needs. So we'll yep. probably be looking for a new house at that point. You know, and if we were in a situation where we didn't have a lot of income, adding another child could mean that we need to hire a babysitter or it might mean we have to send our kids to a certain kind of school. Right. And and it might hurt us financially and have to downsize yeah. the house. Right. And and it might put us, you know, in that that trend of having to sell because we had a positive thing happen, but now we have to adjust for it. Right. So, right. yeah. So there's a lot of situations that can cause people to be motivated to sell their property. And with that motivation comes the opportunity to make a deal. Mm -hmm. And it's a win-win situation. You're not trying to pull one over on this person or anything right. like that. You're trying to help them solve their problem. And it, you have to solve your problem, which is, I'm assuming, some kind of financial gain for you. But at the end of the day, it's a win-win situation, not something where you win and they lose. Yeah. What I've found from talking to hundreds of people in this industry over the past you know, five years is that if you're in this business for the right reasons, which is to help people solve their problems, you're going to be able to experience a much larger level of success than those that are just chasing the dollar. Right. You've got to be into it for more than just income. You've got to find some type of joy and fulfillment that comes with solving people's problems. Because if you're in it just for the money... And you're not willing, well, not just not willing, but, and and you're not experiencing, you know, personal, you know, satisfaction for solving people's problems, then in a very, you know, delicate market, such as, you know, a market where there's a lot of foreclosures or a market where you're trying to find houses where spouses have died, if you're not at that kitchen table or on the phone or, you know, somewhere talking to that seller, that potential seller, and being able to truly express your sincere interest in solving their problems, you're not going to get that lead. You're not going to get that home. Who's going to get that home is the person that shows up and shows them that you really care about solving their problems. And I'm not telling you to fake it. I'm telling you to actually mean it. You got to show up and say, you know, I'm very sorry for what you're going through. And I understand it's tough. And yes, my business is buying rental properties or my business is buying houses to flip, right? And you share that up front. You say, that is my business. But my business is also to get you out of this situation and get you into a better situation. And so you got you to truly mean it. Yeah. And, and you got to be able to convey that when you're talking to them. And you can't convey falseness. You can't convey that you really want something better for them when your previous actions have said everything but that. Right. You got to make sure that all the relationships that you have built up to that point are positive as well. And that everyone that, that, you know, say it's Sally that you're buying the house from and her husband passed away and she's like, well, I don't know. I just, I don't feel good about it. You want to be able to tell Sally, Sally, call my friends. I want you to call my friends and, and pass people that I've, I've helped out in these situations. You want them, you want Sally to be able to call them and they pick up the phone and say, you got to work with him or you got to work with her. Yes, he's going to make money. But you're not going to be in this situation anymore. Right. We had a tornado hit our town a little over a year ago. Mm -hmm. And we we lived it with the people in our community. And there were a lot of homes that were devastated. And you were on the Nextdoor app and found a woman who was looking to sell her house. Started speaking with her. The house was... in pretty rough shape because a tree had crashed through her kid's bedroom mm -hmm. and they were just emotionally destroyed just like the house. I no mean, couldn't. the trauma of waking up in the middle of the night and having a tree through the middle of your house and it, it rained the whole next day too. So any kind of recovery was not even, I mean, it was 
any house that was exposed got soaked. Yeah. And, I mean, you spent that whole week out with a chainsaw helping people get out of their house in some situations, out of their driveway. I mean, it was it was devastating. Yeah. And you worked with this woman for, what, a month maybe? For about a month, month and a half. Yeah. And she had other offers that were higher than the price we could offer, mm-hmm. just given the damage to the house and what we could do with it. But we coached her along on like, hey, here's what's going on with, you know, this. Here's the offer we can make. Yes, we are investors, but we lived through this with you. We understand how you feel. And it was really trying to create a win-win. And it didn't work out, which is perfectly fine. We're happy that they were able to move on. And they just, they could not fathom rebuilding their family home because of the the trauma that came with yeah. that disaster they ended up going with a buyer i believe that that gave them probably about 15 grand more than us yeah and you know that buyer might have had that ability to spread right because when you're buying a house for an investment property or a flip you've got to have your bottom line and you got to make sure that the time that you're putting into that property is going to be worth you know the money that that you're going to be Otherwise, opportunity costing away. Mm-hmm. So you, we had our bottom line, and we were very upfront about it. We say this is our bottom line, and you know I understand you got a an existing mortgage to pay off, and you know I know you got your needs. And I said, well, and we were just very transparent. We said yeah. this is our this is our line, and they called us several times. I mean, and, you were and, talking on the phone with her for twenty thirty minutes at a clip, yeah, like just talking about family and. The I think, experience of the tornado. I think we ultimately did save her from oh, some wholesalers. That, wholesalers that, that were not. That did not have her best interest in mind. Right. Um, I think she did end up selling to another investor that either flipped it or now owns it as a rental. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm just glad that we were able to help her understand the type of investors there are. Right. Because a lot of people just think, you know, real estate investor, they're all flippers. Or... Real estate investor, they're all landlords. Right. There are a lot of different ways to be a real estate investor. And our goal was, and we felt like it was our duty to just educate her. Yeah. Because she was a part of our community and right. went through something very tragic, just like we did. Right. So. Yeah. So that was a, I mean, that was, I guess you could say that was a macro trend in mm-hmm. our market because that yeah. disaster, I think it, was it destroyed macro a couple hundred micro. homes. Yeah. yeah. So... You in a market like changing market, yes, the economy is uncertain, but there are still people dying. There's still people going through divorce, mm-hmm. still people in financial situations. I who knows what's gonna happen with student loans where we're sitting we're at the end of July when we're recording this, so we're kind of waiting to see if anything's gonna happen there. Right. So by the time this comes out, you guys know in the future what's gonna happen with that. <laughs> but you know, there's a lot hanging on these big trends that are macro, but impact you on a micro level. That's right. So there's opportunities even in a high market. That's right. So find the strategy that works for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Door knocking is a great strategy right now because you really get to know people in the neighborhood and the community and can find a lot of information. That's right. There is a strategy that works in every market. Mm -hmm. You just got to be very, Smart about it and diligent. Yeah, right. For us, when we were really starting and investing, adding value through burring mm-hmm. was great. And we were able to get really good financing. Yeah. So that worked for us. So find what's working in this market and really educate and then take action. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, what we, we've only purchased one house this year because we've been focused on creating great content like this podcast and getting our book out and things like that. So the one house that we did buy this year, we thought it was higher priced than we really wanted to pay, but we were willing to pay it because we knew the fundamentals worked It cash flowed, it hit our criteria. Mm-hmm. And we knew in three years, we were not going to be upset that we bought that house. No, I'm, I'm very happy we have that house. And, you know, the people that live in that home are very happy to have a place to stay. Right. And so. we we added a lot of value to it, though, by adding a bedroom and converting a half bath into a full bath. Mm-hmm. So that's where we were confident paying, quote unquote, over market. But in the long run, it was a good choice. Yeah. So if you're investing for a shorter term horizon or if you're flipping, 
the current price really matters. But if you're investing on a longer horizon, spreading that additional cost over a 30-year mortgage is not going to have a huge impact on your cash flow. Yeah. If for some reason the market does change and let's say your Airbnb shuts down, when you entered into that property, if you strategized and said, okay, it's going to negative cash flow as a single family home. Let's say a negative cash flow is $400. It would be very wise for you to say, okay, this $400 from my W-2 income is going to be dedicated for that property just in case. Mm -hmm. Absolutely dedicated to that property just in case. And when the market gets to a point to where it will cash flow as a single family rental, I will no longer allocate this money from my W-2, my job, toward that home. Now, what yeah. I'm saying is use that $400 a month from your W-2 and put it in the bank for that property. Right. Yeah. And just to carry whether it's it, from your W-2 case. or other investment properties. Yeah. Just Maybe have you have another house that cash flows 600 a month. And you say, okay, this house doesn't cash flow 600 a month. It cash flows 200 a month. And I'm allocating this 400 toward this house right. just in case. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, no matter what strategy you take, the safest way to approach it is cash or access to cash. Mm -hmm. Because if you wind up in a situation where you can't continue with that strategy that you've been using, yeah. but you've got money in the bank, you can weather that storm a lot easier and a lot less stressfully. And you can sleep at night <laughs> if you have cash or access to cash. You don't necessarily have to have it sitting, earning 0% interest. But if you have a line of credit or financial friends and can get access to that cash, it can make all the difference between going yeah. bust and because let's say, continuing you know, to thrive. Let's say your note gets called for some strange reason. You know, say one of your home's notes gets called because there's a call in most every mortgage. Yep. And, you know, let's say one for $200,000 gets called and you still owe $170,000 on the mortgage. Do you have a way to get money? For, do you have a way to get one hundred seventy grand? Right. Because if that note gets called, there's probably some big things happening. Yeah. And there's a likelihood that a bank is not going to give you money for it. Right. So how are you going to pay $170,000? And that call is probably going to say you got 30 or 60 or 90 days to pay it. What are you going to do? Right. And that's where relationships are huge yeah. and important. And having financial friends are huge and important. You might go from you owning a great investment property that brings you $500 a month to you now share that home in an LLC or a trust with five other financial friends because that's how many people it took to rally up that $170,000. Yeah. And now you just have a piece of that pie. But right. you've got to have those strategies in, in mind for when those situations arise. Yeah. Well, you, it's, we were playing the game cash flow and uh, we were winding down the game. We put a time on it because we could have stayed up till midnight playing. Mm -hmm. But we it was the, pretty much the last deal of the game. And it required a $40,000 down payment. And the person with the card could not afford that full down payment. Yeah. So she went around the circle and asked everyone how much cash they had to and see if we could come up as a group with that down payment. And then we'd figure out how to split the deal. Mm -hmm. Turns out it, it wasn't going to happen. There wasn't enough cash available. Yeah. But... And just so you know, we, we had two different families over... To play cash flow with us, and there were what eight players yeah. during this game. Yeah. yeah, so there was a lot of players for this right. game. But like you were saying, I'm sorry. Yeah, so we tried to pull the money together, couldn't do it. So mm -hmm. the deal, we lost the deal. But the willingness to share a piece of the pie was so interesting to see and so cool. And there were some some high schoolers there playing with us. It was a uh, awesome yeah. because you know one of the very first deals came up, and one of the players who was a high schooler said, oh, I can't afford this deal. So he was going to put the card back. And I said, wait a second. Do you want to sell that deal to someone else? Or do you want some help? And I remember I went in. Now, this was a fun card to do because there was like this duplex that came up and him and another player had all of the money raised. and They were going to split the deal. And I said, hey, what if I come in as a third party and I just give some money? And I don't want any of the cash flow. I just want the ability to capture some of the upside if there is ever a buyer. And I didn't put a lot of money into it. You know, it was like two grand in the game. 
But later on in the game, like an hour and a half later, my two grand became what fifteen twenty thousand yeah. dollars in the game. So there was a teaching opportunity there to show them that you don't always have to get the cash flow, or you don't always have to get the asset, or you don't always have to be the individual owner. There are ways to to partner and to have you know professional relationships within a business that own properties, and you know everyone wins. Right. So it was a fun yeah. learn, learning moment for them because they even said, I would have never thought of that. And right. it's great to just open their eyes to that. Yeah. Yeah. So with the changes in the market and investing in this uncertain market, having key relationships is key. It's yeah. important. Hey, it's key. <laughs> yeah. Like the, <laughs> the key to unlocking your dream life. Hey, Pathfinder's dream. Yes. Nice little drop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think... No matter what strategy you approach, make sure you have some kind of reserves available mm-hmm. to be able to weather the storm. Yeah. Anything else from you at this point? Cash I mean, or access to cash. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. And just know, don't believe everything you hear on talk radio or on podcasts <laughs> or in books when it comes to predicting markets. Yeah. It, it truly is nearly unpredictable. Until you get right up close to it. Once you're a few months away from a market turn, there are going to be indicators of certain things happening. There are going to be certain indicators saying, "Uh uh-oh, these companies are doing this, or this type of market is doing this. You know, the jewelry market is doing this, or the car market is doing this, so that might indicate this. There will be some leadway into something like that, but there won't always be. Yeah, I think... You're right, but you're forgetting the wild card that is the U.S. government. That's right. And they hold, it's like playing poker and they're playing with a whole nut, they're playing with Magic the Gathering cards and <laughs> they just throw down a goblin or something. I don't know anything about magic. Hey, goblins are real. Okay, and vampires, in, in right? Yeah. yeah. Goblins, vampires. Yeah. So you're Merman. playing with a certain deck of cards and then all of a sudden there's a goblin thrown at you and you're like, what the hell is this? Yeah. <laughs> so just. Just when you think a market's about to do this, then, you know, the Federal Reserve drops a yeah. $40 trillion dollar. Surplus Who knows? Into or that market, <laughs> or COVID happens. I mean, I don't think anyone right. could have predicted that. Right, right. Um, so there are so many factors that yes, it might seem like the market's trending a certain way, and then that goblin comes up and it's like, whoa! Do? Didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> so I think to me, the safest way to be prepared is having the cash or access to cash, yeah. so that you can respond because. A problem becomes less of a problem when you can solve it yeah. with money. So essentially feather your nest, build relationships. When I say feather your nest, that means have cash or access to cash. Okay. Right. So that's a that's a Bill Cook term that oh. I've, I've heard from him. You know, feather your nest and then begin different uh, educating, you know, efforts for different types of markets. Right. And then build key relationships with people that can help you achieve your your dream life and then wait. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, analyze deals as they come and and do the ones that make sense and align with your roadmap to get to your dream life. Right. But otherwise, you know, stay vigilant. Yeah. Stay diligent. Definitely. Never stop educating and don't believe everything you hear on the radio. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Educate, but, you know, kind of trust, but verify everything. All right. Well, thanks y'all for hanging out with us and listening to us talk about how to invest when the market looks uncertain. What lessons can you take from our experience and apply to your life? Don't let the time you just invested go to waste. You only get one life, so live it purposefully. That's all we have for you today. See you next time. Are you ready to discover and build your dream life? Then it's time to become a Pathfinder. Head over to onpurposeinvestor.com and sign up for our newsletter to get tips and tricks to help you find your path and get the latest from our blog. If you haven't already, we'd really appreciate an honest review on your favorite podcast app. If you're enjoying this show, share it with friends, family, and fellow investors. See you next time at the On Purpose Investor Podcast.